What's going on guys, Carmine here, and welcome to my Season 6 Episode 9 Q&A. Sorry for the video being so late, but, you know, shit happens. Let's get on to it. First question, why doesn't Melisandre resurrect Rickon? Well, I think there's a reason for that, but for the sake of it, let me argue both sides. She probably can resurrect anybody she wants. Thoros Amir was able to resurrect Beric, and there aren't any special theories about him being a Targaryen, so... Yes, I'm sure Rickon and Wulun can definitely be brought back to life. Hell, Beric was stabbed in the eye by the mountain during a fight, and Thoros was still able to bring him back, so there is hope for Wunwun. I assume the only way you can't be brought back is if you've been chopped up into pieces, and your body is put in the blender, and then liquefied. But at the same time, I'm going to assume that there are rules to the whole resurrection thing that we don't know about. In the television show, Thoros has only been resurrecting Beric and nobody else. Maybe it is the Lord of Light who is allowing certain individuals to be brought back, and only certain people, not everyone. So it's kind of a toss-up as to how this can be accomplished. I mean, whenever they go up on that rant about how the Lord has a plan for everyone, some of us just roll our eyes and just want them to you know, show us dragons and titties, but maybe there's something to that. Maybe the Lord of Light does have a plan and only certain people can be resurrected. If she tried it out on Rickon, it may not work because Rickon is not in his plan or something. Who knows, but I do hope that conversation is brought up. Next question, why are you so harsh on the length of the episodes this season when in fact it is the next to longest season in the show history? I don't think this season has been the longest in the show's history, and the reason you think that is probably because you went to the HBO website and looked at the schedule for this season. For example, it said that episode 9 would be over an hour long, right? But actually, if you exclude the intro, the outro, the last time on Game of Thrones segment, and the behind the scenes footage, it's actually about 55 to 56 minutes long. Once again, the reason I'm excluding the intro and outro is because I've seen them over a hundred times. I get that the intro does get changed every now and then, with new locations being added to the map, but it's essentially the same thing every time. I know some of you pirate the show, so you don't care, but I pay for HBO Go, and I'm paying for content, and I want to see the story, and anything extra can be uploaded on HBO's YouTube page, which they do upload on. The only reason all that is added up in the episode is to make it look longer than it actually is, so don't be fooled. But the reason I'm so harsh on it being so short is because you know for a fact that almost all the storylines have been stretched out so much because of it, and that's just ridiculous. Extra storylines could have been added in almost every episode had they given each of them more time to include things. Take the Hound's revenge in episode 8 and how anticlimactic that was. All he did was kill four guys and assist the Brotherhood in hanging the other three. That scene took less than 5 minutes, and you're honestly telling me that they couldn't have added that in in episode 7? Come on, that's bullshit, and you know I'm right. Almost every single storyline has been stretched so far out this season, and because of that, many characters are doing the exact same things they were doing last season. Cersei is still fighting against the Sparrows, Bran is still beyond the wall doing his vision thing, Jaime is outside King's Landing again, Brienne is running errands for the people, and Danny is still in Marine. Sure, there are certain circumstances that each character is facing in those environments that are slightly different, but essentially they're still doing the exact same things. Think about it for a minute. Next question, John and Sansa have three major castles to divide up. Who do you think they bestow them onto, and why? I think the Wildlings will get some of those territories. I mean, I mean, John just can't ask them to help in defeating the Boltons and not give them something in return, right? House Umber and Karstark chose the wrong side, and I think there should be some punishment for siding against their leech lords, but then again, you could argue that the Boltons were made wardens of the North, and that they were only following orders. That aside, I think the Wildlings, especially Tormund, will get the Umber Seat of Last Heart, and all the lands that come with it. As for the Karstarks, well, their lands may be divided up amongst the other houses who chose to fight with the Starks, like the Mazens, Mormonts, and the Hornwoods. As for House Bolton's Dreadfort, I think it'd be fitting to tear that bitch down and make sure House Bolton becomes extinct, just like what Tywin did to House Reign of Castamere. Exterminate every last one of them and make sure the ruins of their castle are left behind as a lesson for everybody else. Next question, why didn't the Bolton soldiers turn on Ramsay after he started raining arrows down on them? Because I doubt those who were sent in there to kill Jon knew that he would be doing that. Ramsay probably didn't expect any of his men to really come out of that charge alive. He just wanted to whittle down as many Stark soldiers as he could at the cost of his own men. And also because he's an asshole. They made a point to show that Davos wouldn't order arrows in on the fight because they would risk shooting their own soldiers. Davos is a nice guy and Ramsay isn't, and the writers need to keep showing us that. Another reason could also be because it's common for lords to do that to soldiers to reduce competition and as a way to make gains on another person's land. For example, there is a battle in the books where Roose Bolton is given command of troops and is going to battle against Tywin Lannister. He sends men from other houses in the front to fight the Lannister soldiers first and then keeps a lot of his own men in the back. 
The reason he does this is because he's looking to weaken the forces of houses whose lands surround his. And like Ramsay, he's also an asshole. But I too expected many of the soldiers to turn on Ramsay, but at the same time, the Stark army had less soldiers in their ranks, and about half of their forces were filled with wildlings. If you're a man of the North who has to make a decision on who to fight for, would you fight for Ramsay who has more numbers on his side, or for the army with less men and who chose to fill the ranks with barbaric wadlings your people have been fighting for generations? It's a tough decision and many of them kept to Ramsay's side because they thought he could win, and he would have if it weren't for the Knights of the Vale. Next question, why do you pronounce the names different? It's Cersei, not Cersei. Yeah, well, some people say Gendry instead of Gendry. Connor. But believe it or not, I actually get this quite a bit, so let me address it now. According to George Martin himself, the names can be pronounced as close to it as possible and whatever you're comfortable with saying. Hell, if you've ever listened to the audiobooks, the guy who reads them refers to Peter as Petar, and I forgot which other YouTuber does this, but someone refers to Varys as Varys? I have no idea how he gets that, but at the same time, I called Danny's father Ares instead of Eris, so it's whatever. As long as the other person knows who you're talking about, and they will, it's fine. Just don't refer to Tyrion as Tim or something off like that, and I think you'll be okay. Oh, and for the person who asked me this, the creator of Game of Thrones actually refers to the character as Cersei instead of Cersei, like some of the HBO characters do. You can hear this if you look up some of the behind-the-scenes footage on HBO's YouTube page about episode 1 of season 5 regarding Maggie the Frog. So technically, I'm not wrong. Next question, where was Ghost and why wasn't he with Jon? Ghost was not able to be in the battle simply because of budget constraints, and this time it's true. I've said this before in previous videos and a lot of you guys got on to be about it, but according to the director of this episode, the budget would not allow for Ghost to be in the battle, which is a shame because I would have loved to have him in there with Jon helping him out and such. There were moments in the battle where men were running up on Jon and they got tackled by like another guy or run over by a horse. I would have loved to have seen some guy get his ass kicked by Ghost just jumping all over him to save Jon. The director said that they had to choose between Ghost or one one and ultimately they went with the Giant, which I understand completely, but at the same time, couldn't they just had Ghost on screen for one minute, standing next to Sansa and having Jon say something like, Okay boy, stay with Sansa, I'll be back, or something like that? Or is that too much of a nitpick for some people? And last question, why has Sansa been keeping her relationship with Peter away from everyone, and why didn't she tell Jon about the Vale army? Probably because Sansa doesn't trust Littlefinger at all and she isn't psychic. Yeah, in hindsight, she would have she should have told Jon that she called the Knights of the Vale for assistance and that would have saved the lives of d uh, hundreds of men, but at the same time, she doesn't know what good that would do and how long it would take to get for them to get there. Not only that, but why would she tell Jon that they were coming and have him plan accordingly and input the Vale Knights into strategic position only for them not to show up? There were a lot of unknown variables that come into play here when talking about Soldiers of the Vale and even Peter Baelish himself who is still playing the game. Plus, I doubt John would have trusted Peter Baelish at all and might not even accept his help. The Northmen are very stubborn and prideful people and I'm sure some of them would have liked to have kept the Battle of Winter between the people of the North and not have included outsiders who probably have their own agenda. Not only that, but think about it like this. The North is in a very weakened state and this conflict will make them even weaker. Including another house in the battle will be very risky considering they still have fresh number of troops and could plot to take over the north for the crown or for their own gains. Sansa probably didn't take that into account, but she's relying on Peter's lust for power and his love for her to keep all that in check, and that would probably be something Jon wouldn't be comfortable with beforehand. The one thing I'm really looking forward to is when and how Sansa and Jon will find out that Peter is the one who helped betray Ned Stark during Season 1. That'll be quite the interesting conversation. And maybe when Varys comes back to Westeros, he'll try to go against Peter one last time and use the information he knows to undermine the Peter-Sansa alliance by sending a raven over there and spilling the beans, because he and Peter were both there when Ned was betrayed, and Peter is the one who put the dagger to his throat. But, thank you so much for watching. If you have any more questions, feel free to leave them down below, and hopefully, myself or someone else will answer them for you. Before I forget, I'd like to give a big thanks to Miss Maud for helping me out by contributing Norwegian subtitles for all my latest videos. Believe it or not, according to my channel analytics, I have a sizable sub base from Norway. So I do appreciate the help. If anybody else wants to contribute subtitles for all my future videos in different languages, feel free to do so. It'll be very helpful and appreciated. Guys, once again, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to support the channel and hit that like button. Subscribe if you already haven't. And I'll see you all next time. Have a good one.